Christian Alvin from the University of Copenhagen, and he will talk about the Ludovic's endowment for quantum field chains um, in a field. So I'll just leave the stage to you. Thank you for the introduction and for this opportunity, and also for accommodating online. Uh, this talk is based on joint work with Mark Gaper and the Berlin Opera Gaper. And the archive number uh, here. Okay. So here's the outline of the talk. Um, I, I want to explain our result in terms of the, the XY chain, uh, just because this model has all of the properties that, that we will assume for our neighbors, which is a Lee Robbins that for two chains uh, with strong homocyte characters. And I will refer to these. Uh, So um, here is the, uh, the XY model. And what we're interested in is uh, quasi local properties, the Heisenberg dynamics that are generated over some finite interval, uh, say from minus m to n. And, um, you know, for us, uh, the finite volume of this section is fine, but all of our estimates will be uniform in quality, so they'll apply to the thermodynamic limit as well. I've highlighted here uh, the term that I call field, where we get the on site perturbation, uh, the sigma z is coupled to the Hamiltonian by uh, real companies and I. And the idea is that uh, because the generator of these dynamics is, is local and so it has very fast spatial decay, uh, the map is quasi local. So, what I mean is that if you take a local observable, and you evolve it under the Heisenberg matrix. Then, as a function of time, uh, you can approximate this evolved observable uh, pretty well uh, in some, some region which can so support of the original observable uh, at time zero. And you can prove uh, such, such an approximation as an equation point one using uh, so called the Robbins bounds, which I will define in a second. But the idea is that if you use these bounds, uh, then you can very explicitly determine the constants, the free factors, uh, and, and the decay properties of this bound in a way which is independent uh, of the system size. So uh, here's our first question. How does the choice of the field uh, in the XY model affect the, uh, these constants, free factors, and time decay? I have uh, some examples. The, the first uh, result I want to mention is that if you take these constants and, and time dependent on the thing, be independent of the field strength that you did, and this is a result we would not be given a threat uh, since the client. And I have uh, a form of their result, uh, or, you know, rewritten for our purposes, uh, which states that if you have a nearest neighbor interaction, which is a uh, uniformly bounded strength, then you can perturb it by any on site direction. And uh, this Lee Robbins that will hold in equation point three in a way where the two factors and the, uh, the velocity term and the spatial decay do not depend on the on site direction strength. They are determined only by uh, the strength of the nearest neighbor interaction. So point three here is an example of the Robbins that uh, a dynamo of a commentator. Okay. Another result I want to mention, which is uh, specifically for the XY chain, is that if you choose the, the couplings of fields to be quasi periodic, uh, a so called Fibonacci field, then you have an anomalous that is of a stretch exponential instead of an exponential. Uh, this is due to dominating others. And um, this is not a, a talk about disorder systems, but I want to mention that if you take the, uh, the couplings of the field terms to be IID random variables, along with other uh, physical assumptions, then you can take in expectation the velocity zero uh, for a so called uh, zero velocity from that. Uh, and the result I said here is the opposite in terms of the Okay. 
Um, so then I want to ask that an adjacent question. Um, if heuristically it seems like then you could expect the choice of field to be able to slow transport some uh, hand wave uh, And I explain this using a, a cartoon. Um, I have initially an observable and an observable peak localized to the left and to the right of a distinguished field site X. And then I time evolve uh, A. And so this green shaded region is uh, slightly imprecisely the, the modification of the local observable using the Heisenberg X, where most of the observable remains localized in the region around the original support. And one could hope that if you increase the strength of the field at this distinguished site X, um, the observable A has some difficulty passing through uh, that field site because they're taking the coupling to the positive infinity. And if you have multiple field sites between them, maybe that, that appears as a three factor as a, a, a product of the field strengths. And uh, this is what we prove um, with some limitations. Uh, we do not assume much about the user action itself, except that it's nearest neighbor, or finite range will do. But on the field, we assume a lot of things, and, and those assumptions are, are typical. So, one thing we assume is that the field operators themselves uh, have distinct eigenvalues, or the each eigenvalue is simple uh, site bias. Furthermore, we don't allow an arbitrary density of the field. Uh, we actually uh, say that we can only perturb with some sparsity depending on some scale uh, that we fix from the beginning. And the scale uh, is the, the, the prefactor of the spatial decay in NRSS. Uh, we run with that. With these assumptions, uh, we consider the dynamics uh, generated by the nearest neighbor interaction perturbed by sparse field. Uh, coupled by uh, non zero factors, uh, which I denote by lambda x. And then what we are able to prove with these assumptions is that uh, there does exist such a, or, uh, uh, such, such a Lebron scalar here, where the prefactor uh, incorporates the product of the field strengths, uh, where the uh, of, of field sets that occur in between A and B. And here I assume that A is localized on the left and B is localized on the right of the field zone. And uh, the price that we pay uh, is that our time dependence and our, our spatial dependence are our worst. We, we have some polynomial prefectors um, there, and, and the degree of those polynomials uh, is the number of fields I can So I, I want to stage the proof and at least explain where these polynomial prefectors come from. Um, so, the, the idea is that we will prove um, the lead office that was approved or told if we have one field type between uh, A and B, and then we will uh, iteratively uh, improve um, uh, our RS, and the, assuming that there are uh, N field types. So, uh, the way we do this is we pick a distinguished field type X and we compare our original data with the dynamics generated by a Hamiltonian, which would appear if you took a large uh, limit, uh, large shuffle. Uh, so I've written the Hamiltonian here. And uh, our, our assumption on the spectrum of the field uh, operators uh, implies that if you start with an observable localized on the left of X, then you have a large coupling limit mechanism uh, that observable localized on the left of X. Then, uh, by uh, the kind of do we melt type argument, compare uh, the commutator with the original dynamics and the large limit uh, dynamics, and write that difference in terms of an integral over a double commutator, where the, the blue minor uh, sort of bolt is uh, constant in the coupling strength because they're all equal, uh, and also locally supported around the site X. And you can do a lot of manipulations that eventually get this to the form of a sum of integrals of uh, an exponential or complex exponential which involves the, the, the strength of the field, say x, 
times some matrix value function, which is uh, continuously different. Then, um, because this matrix value function is, is, you know, it looks like a double commutator, you can differentiate it to that expression in terms of double commutators. Uh, you can resolve that using partial traces and you get a down there. And um, you can integrate by parts this exponential term and get out of that inverse uh, power of the plan. And all that being set up, you get a single site bound, uh, which I have listed here from this A. And, and yeah, the time and distance dependencies are, are the same, the main result of which they can be Then uh, the procedure for getting the, uh, the main result is to assume that you have such a bound uh, for you know, the leftmost n minus 1 filter. And then in the proof of proposition A, we substitute in for your a priori problems of that, your improved the problems of that. That incorporates the field. Uh, so that the claim is that when you do this uh, naive double commutator uh, that you, you pick up powers uh, of, of, of D. Um, and you know, I, I put naive in quotes because I don't think we do anything special, so I think this is one place where where maybe you can get a better dependence on, on the distance between the supports of A and B. Uh, but I'm not quite sure how to do that. And uh, the, the degree of uh, the, 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 the polynomial P factor for the time dependence comes from the fact that when you do this iterative procedure, you integrate uh, n times. Uh, here, um, I would also be interested to know if maybe you can get a better time dependence, uh, because as it stands up, our result uh, doesn't quite lead to a, a reduction of the Robles velocity exactly because you have this polynomial three factor. Um, but then it's mm -hmm. you know, just to remind me now around the 12 minutes. Ah, okay, thank you. Um, so my point is that there uh, that there's some room for improvement that I'll that question open. Um, so this is my last slide. Uh, we we have done well set up to do with this too. Find some kind of dependence on the three factor of the problem to that uh, on field strength. And uh, th there are situations where our main result is sharper than what you expect uh, from the lead problems to that that I showed before, the, this uh, MRSS map. Uh, so I have some simple here. And I think the only item for the help that I would like to mention is that uh, I would like to see a better dependence on, on, on the, the distance and the, the time. Uh, Precisely for a moving small number of three factors. Uh, but I'm not sure how to do it. Okay, thank you for your attention. I will stop there. Thank you very much for your talk. So, I think we have questions. I'm not sure whether there are questions in the room. Maybe the local moderators can have any questions. Questions? Yes, uh, bring the microphone. Ah, okay. uh, he's bringing one. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Can you hear? Oh, wait a second. Maybe I have to, do I have to activate here. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, yeah, I was wondering, should I think of this more as a theoretical investigation into kind of map that takes interactions to Lee Robinson balance? Or are there any concrete applications of either these results or the improved ones you were sort of uh, talking about that might be possible uh, to concrete models? Yes, uh, thanks for the question. Uh, I would say this result is uh, out of theoretical curiosity, but I think uh, it, it, uh, the time and distance dependence could be improved, but one might actually be able to get some application of um, I, I think that's the complete answer to that. And any, uh, I, I'm personally interested in this because I, I was just curious about when uh, this commutator that uh, is sharp for whether it can be improved and whether it can be something dependent on the field. Uh, 
Um, so, okay, so this one is, you know, like this same view can do some output elements, and output elements give the same block diagonal structure, and we also want that blocks to be minimal, of course, like you just want to get the most out of it. So, I mean, like, in that theory, we don't know that we want is to decompose, to fully decompose T uh, as a representation of, of itself as a group. Uh, okay, so like resources to you have a variable, you have a variable where like, we assume that we can sample from T uniformly and that we can evaluate the matrices up to floating point precision. So I guess this is like super like this is pretty pretty uh, you know like uh, realistic in many cases. We also have resources that are a little bit more on the black box side, so so you can just evaluate like a set of generators of the group. And then of course that scale a little bit like worse there, uh, but you know it's, it's a little bit like more like putting the you know like the, the four wheel drive version on the on the on the front. So and what do we right now? Because of course that like, we, we want to get things with like maybe imperfect. <laughs> so the, with perfection. So we allow uh some imperfections to recover the matrix U. So it, it, it's, it's somehow similar to being textured up closer to block diagonalizing. So what we want is somehow that the that the blocks uh, out of the state are very close to the blocks that the uh, the you know like the perfect algorithm would spit out, and then we allow for a small user set probability behavior, and um, this allows us to like regularize some things, and you can like the dependence of the probability behavior is anyway logarithmic, so you can push it down essentially as much as you want. Um, okay, so what would we do? What would we do? So essentially our approach is dividing the problem in two. So we start with a pass to this to block diagonalize the, the, the group. Uh, this was coded in RepLab because we already coded before. I even entered the entire the, the, the project and we also like wrote a paper about it here. This is, a, this is the name of the paper. Um, and here what is what it does. It samples a random uh, like a Gaussian matrix. So basically a matrix with like Gaussian entries. And it approximately projects this matrix to the commutant of the group. So it basically finds a way of computing this, this integral. This is like an expectation over the group element. So you just conjugate by, by a bunch of group elements and then like average. Um, and then like, this average uh, out uh, matrix, what, what you do is that you root out the eigenspaces. And these eigenspaces will be the blocks. And maybe just let me give you the reason why these second spaces are the blocks. Just quickly, it's, it's nothing like, like super deep or anything, but it's, it's good to keep in mind. So suppose that psi lambda is an eigenvector of n0, and suppose that, you know, like just we're in perfect in the line, like now, so suppose that this approximation is actually exact. So n0 is just equal to this actual projection of the matrix onto the commutant. Um, all right, and we act with first some group element G prime, and then we act with M zero. And I'm going to prove that G prime times psi lambda is an eigenvector with the same identity, which I take to be lambda. And what I do for that, well, I just commute the two because now, like you know, this matrix commutes for the group elements, and I do it by definition, I projected it onto the commutant, and then when well, I act on it, and I get like the eigenvalue out. So uh, you know, like these, these eigenspaces are preserved by the group action, so they are like the, the blocks, right? Like you, if you act with like a block matrix, like a group element being like a block matrix, with onto a vector of one block, the vector will stay in the same block. Um, so, okay, so like the, the good thing is that this algorithm works super well in practice. Um, yeah, like this, like, yeah, this is just kind of tends to work extremely well. And the problem is that we couldn't prove any formal correctness guarantee for, for this algorithm. We tried for some time, but then we ran into problems of, you know, like uh, eigenspaces on, uh, of like functionals of random matrices in finite dimensions, and most of the results that we found there were like, you know, like in the, in the limit. Essentially, so we couldn't like give a formal like, theoretical guarantee, although we got some like, really good indication that, of course, that should work as it does in practice. So what we need next is what we we'll propose next is okay, well let's, let's keep this heuristic and then certify the job. So the first heuristic spits out a bunch of projectors that are the blocks, and then we certify each projector. So we certify that it's this like, invariant block, and that it's also minimum. So 
So let me see. So I'm like, to certify, uh, this like the, the procedure gets a little bit more involved. So I'm just going to go over like the rough workflow, and of course you, you can ask me for for me to go there. And this was written up in this in this uh, paper that we published like early this year, and or that we put in the archive early this year, and then the code this year. So it's, it's already coded in Python, and we are working on like including it into that uh, lab itself. So that is like a single kind of like big house containing every sub uh, Let's see. Okay. So the first thing that we do is take some one of the eigen projectors of Alpha V0. So okay, so we see this as an input, and what we will do is we compute the commutator with a bunch of random group elements and take the norm of that. And with this norm, essentially we can bound how close this projector is to being the variant, is to being the commutant. And then this will allow us to bound the distance to the closest invariant projector. And this takes a few, you know, like a few steps of like inequality, so then it's not too like too complicated, and we get some bound on, on this thing. Uh, and yeah, like this eigen projector is an eigen projector of this invariant matrix. And um, so okay, so like, that's that's the first line. And then what we do after that is we want to prove that like the, 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 this like this corresponding projector is also minimal, that there's no like sub projector that is also invariant. And what we do there is use character theory for, for the people that know the, the terminology. What we do is evaluate the, like, the character, which is like this tracing the product on a bunch of on, on a bunch of random group elements. And like we, we we essentially estimate that okay, so like the character is a function that goes from the group to the complex number, so assigns to like one complex number to each group element with this like tracing product. And this vector of numbers for like a minimal block will have two norm equals to one. So essentially what we do is we estimate the form and then well like we, we do some like tricks to like improve the improve the improve the like um, uh, uh, you know, like runtime, and then what we get is well, okay, like, some algorithm that outputs, okay, like, yeah, like, the block is minimal with some probability of failure. So essentially, there's like some small probability that is user set to have uh, a false, like, we think about it, a false positive. So essentially, like, the, the probability that you say, ah, yeah, it's minimal, and then it's not minimal, so, which is kind of like the thing that we want to avoid. And um, that's and just busy and make sure that your line twelve minutes twelve, so you have two to three minutes. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, okay, so so this is uh, what we call like the, the, the being approximately invariant, and this is approximately irreducible. So okay, so this is now my last uh, slide, or almost last. Um, so okay, so as a summary, what we did is uh, divide the the block mechanization in two parts. Um, one is a fast heuristic to block the analysis, and then a second one that, you know, like to provide a formal guarantee that this is actually like close to the, the real decomposition. Um, this this algorithm like outperforms a set of the art algorithms for like formal formal guarantee uh, decompositions of of, uh, of group representations, and it works for both finite and compact new groups. Um, or like maybe uh, the state of the art is one algorithm that works for finite groups, and we can like, send it essentially to all compact groups. Um, but, okay, well, like, as I said, this comes with a probability of success that is guaranteed. Um, the, like, the implemented the algorithms here are the two implementations. This is the heuristic, this is the certifier, and they actually also like, perform really well in, in practice. So, for example, we tried like, you know, like representations of two dimensions, like 1000 or 2000. And within like my laptop, which which is not like particularly optimized or anything, I brought like within one hour basically. So so it's, it's no big problem. Uh, and yeah, we, we, like, we go back to the application and use it to reduce the dimension of SCPs, which is by the way already implemented in, in the heuristic. So the heuristic receives a big SCP and the symmetry group and returns the optimized SCP and, and the other the optimized SCP. So that's pretty nice. So I would like to say thanks for listening. Here are the links to the code. Here are the papers uh, on, the, on the corresponding uh, codes. And yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. 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 Thank you very much.
does not seem to be the case here. So, uh, sorry, yes, it does not seem, there seem to be no question on site. So, as you can tell you, we have time to continue. So, let me thank Felipe uh, again for a very clear presentation. And um, I'm not sorry, I'm going to use that technique in, in what I'm doing. Okay, so then let's move on and with the third talk, or the last talk of the before the break. And so, um, the next speaker is Angela Papel from the EU, yeah. and she will talk about the approximate Tensorization of relative entropy for non commuting conditional expectations. I'm looking forward to that talk, and I think that will be the talk on site. The micro is not on Zoom? Yes, it's okay. Okay, very good. But the micro is not on I'm turning on the microphone so I don't have to hold it the whole time. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, thank you. So, yes. Great. So thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, well, of course, I want to thank the, the organizers for allowing me to talk about this project here. So uh, I'm going to talk today about a joint project in, thanks, in collaboration with Ivan Bagde from uh, INRIA in Paris and Camille Suse, who is also from the Technical University of Munich, same as me. And this project is entitled Approximate Tensorization of the Relative Entropy for Non-Commuting Conditional Expectations. Since we don't have so much time, uh, I'm going straight to the point. And I'm going to, to explain what I mentioned about uh, a result of approximate tensorization of the relative entropy. For that, uh, for those of you who are not super familiar with this quantity, let me remind that the relative entropy of two states, uh, full rank states in finite dimensional Hilbert spaces, uh, rho and sigma, the relative entropy between these two states is given by this expression here. And by a result of approximate tensorization of relative entropy, I mean an inequality of this form. So essentially an upper bound for the relative entropy between the two states in a tripartite system ABC in terms of the sum of two conditional relative entropies in two subsystems. So in this case, we take one subsystem AB and another subsystem BC. And uh, with some constants, some error terms, given by this C and this D here. So in general, C is going to be larger than or equal to one, and this is going to be larger than or equal to zero. And well, I just mentioned these conditional relative entropies, and this is something that needs to be defined in each particular case. So we will see now how we do that. But before going to that, I want to give some motivation for, for our interest in this problem. And it comes actually from uh, the study of quantum many body systems, and in particular, from the study of uh, the speed of convergence of certain thermal evolutions to their equilibriums. So if we consider a quantum Markov semigroup given by these terms here, uh, you know, defined in terms of the, of the generator of the Limbladian here, and we denote by res of t uh, the state rho after a certain time t, then uh, we say that, uh, well, if we have a positivity of a modified logarithmic Sobolev constant, then in particular, this, this yields an inequality of this form. So this in particular yields some entropic convergence, uh, so some exponential convergence with respect to the, the relative entropy. And well, you know, if, if we use here Pinsker's inequality, then we have essentially an upper bound and an exponential convergence with time uh, for even for the, for the one norm distance between the two states. So, uh, studying uh, f systems for which there is positivity of such a constant, of such a modified logarithmic Sobolev constant, is a very important problem in general. And there are some different methods in classical spin systems to try to obtain results of this sort. And, and in particular, the modern proofs due to uh, uh, Ceci and Paganoni, uh, Dipram, Posta from 2002, have the key ingredient of uh, containing some result of quasi-factorization or approximate tensorization of the relative entropy. I'm going to call it indistinctively. Um, well, since they were using this kind of techniques in classical spin systems, we thought maybe we can use something similar in quantum spin systems. 
and this is the main motivation for having inequalities of this form. And also another possible motivation comes from the uh, idea of trying to generalize the well-known inequality of strong subadditivity for a tripartite state in a tripartite system. So trying to generalize this expression that I have here. Again, as I said before, we want to prove inequalities of this form. Where now I'm taking lambda to be just ABC. So uh, we could take some uh, more general setting, but in particular, I'm going to restrict here to the case of lambda tilde being equals to lambda in this picture. And we have these two different motivations. So when we consider mostly the motivation coming from the classical uh, system setting, we have developed some results in the past. And of course, I'm not going to go into details in them, but just to mention that uh, following these arrows, we have reached up at being able to prove some results of positivity of MLSI in some contexts. So this was already nice enough, but then we realized that our techniques were reaching the limit and then we couldn't continue using this kind of techniques because the main result that we have there for a quasi-factorization of the relative entropy is given in this form. So it's given, uh, as I said before, as an upper bound for the relative entropy in terms of these two conditional relative entropies. And in this case, we were taking as the definition of a conditional relative entropy, the difference between the relative entropy in the whole system and the relative entropy in the complement of the system where we are conditioning. And using this kind of definitions, we obtained some uh, nice result with a multiplicative error term that measures how far the state is from being a tensor product between the two separated subsystems, so A and C. But as I said, this was not enough to, to completely solve the problem for the MLSI in, in general. And this is why we decided to take a more abstract approach, which is what we are doing in, in the current project. And for that, what we needed to do was to generalize the property of a strong additivity to the setting of uh, von Neumann algebras in general. And before doing that, since we are going to use this definition for a conditional relative entropy, which is given in terms of a conditional expectation, I'm going to remind you what a conditional expectation is. So if we have two von Neumann algebras, M and N, such that M is a subalgebra of N, and we have a state in the small one, a linear map from the big one to the small one, we say that it's a conditional expectation with respect to this state, if it satisfies these three properties. This is one of the possible equivalent definitions. So the first property is that it's contractive and with respect to the operator norm uh, for every state in the, in the big algebra. For the subalgebra, all the states are invariant under this map. And also, if we consider tracing out with respect to the state with which we are defining the conditional expectation, then tracing out uh, the traces is, is conserved in, in all these cases. So once we have this definition, what we do now is to see, sorry, how we can generalize the, the property of strong subadditivity to this context. And the idea is the following. So if we consider just the, the inequality of the strong subadditivity, given in terms of the von Neumann entropies, we can write this inequality in terms of relative entropies instead, as we do here. And actually what we are doing in these three uh, terms is essentially a, a partial trace that is normalized. So this is in particular a conditional expectation. And then what we can do is instead consider a family of four different von Neumann algebras uh, of this form so that M is contained in the intersection of N1 and N2, and both of them are contained in, in N. And now if we denote by EM, E1 and E2 the conditional expectations onto these three subalgebras, then essentially the inequality above can be rewritten as the inequality that I have here. And this happens, this holds, if and only if, we have what we call the commuting relation, which is the fact that if we compose E1 with, with E2 and in reversely, both of them coincide with the conditional expectation onto the, onto the intersection of both of them. Okay, so this is like uh, the abstract version of, of the thing that I wrote above, but uh, that I wrote above, but actually we can have something in between. So when we consider now the conditional expectations given by just restricting our semigroup to a sub lattice of the whole uh, or to a subsystem of the whole system that we were considering before. Then we can rewrite this expression in the form that I write here. And then of course we have again that this is equivalent to, to having this relation between conditional expectations. And this is something that in the quantum case is almost never going, going to happen. So this is like too restrictive. And this is why what we did in this project was to study uh, for which conditions we have inequalities of this form. So a generalization of the inequality that we have here, but now with multiplicative and additive term. Okay, so 
Uh, this we will see that gives rise to some results in regarding MLSI2 as, as before. And the idea now is the following. So we consider again the same phonemic algebra than before and the conditional expectations associated to them. And if we consider now classical systems, then what we can always prove is an inequality of this form. So we can prove for any temperature that we have an inequality like this, where the multiplicative term is given by this norm that I write here. And this is essentially measuring how far you are from, from this commuting relation that I was writing before. But this is something that is not going to happen in general for quantum systems. And this is why we have to add the multiplicative and error terms, uh, and additive error terms. And the meaning of both of them is the following. So as we said, in the classical case, we don't have an additive term. So the additive term here is going to measure in some sense how far we are from the classical case. And the multiplicative term is going to be a relaxation from the infinite temperature case, because in the infinite temperature case, in principle, one would have C equals one, one would have tensorization there. So this is why this is like a finite temperature relaxation of that condition. And yet, let me just say that whenever we don't have the, the additive error term, so if this is zero, we just say that this result is a strong. It's a strong uh, form of approximate tensorization. Okay, so I'm just going to briefly mention the two main results that we have here. Uh, given to two different sets of techniques. The first one of them is uh, related to some argument of change of measure, and it essentially allows to reduce an inequality of this form for doubly stochastic conditional expectations, so such that the identity is a fixed point of the conditional expectation and it's dual. And if you have something like this, then this change of measure argument allows you to obtain an inequality of this form. And if you don't have the additive term from the beginning, you see that actually you don't get an additive term here, so it's pretty good because we only have the multiplicative term, and this is something that is desirable for, for proving MLSI. But the problem is that this multiplicative term scales very bad with the system size. Instead, what we did was to consider some other argument uh, via pinching, and for that I don't have time to go into details, but the idea essentially is that we decompose the subalgebra that is in the intersection of all the other algebras uh, in, because we can consider, we can see it as a subspace of a B of H for H a Hilbert space. So what we do is to block the compose the Hilbert space, and then we can write the algebra of this form that I write here. And then what we have to consider now is a multiplicative term that is similar to the one that we had before. But now what we are doing is take the maximum of the norm of the differences of these conditional expectations in each of the blocks. And once we have that, we can prove an inequality of this form where here the additive term uh, strongly depends on this pinching map, but I'm not going to go into detail. And just, uh, I'm just going to say that the main tools that we use in this proof are the multivariate trace inequalities that appear in 2017 are extremely useful for, for many purposes. And the change rule for the relative entropy, which I just want to highlight because uh, we can only prove it for the moment for the relative entropy. And actually it's conjecture that it's the only quantity for the, the only entropic quantity for which holds. Okay, so I'm going to go very fast through the application. So the idea is that now we can apply these results to obtain MLSI for different purposes. So for pinching on two different bases, we do it in this paper. And then in more general context, we do it in subsequent papers and we also obtain some uncertainty relations. So for pinching on two different bases, what we do essentially is to consider as before a pinching, but now we do it into two different bases. And then we can prove an inequality of this form if we assume that the two bases are orthonormal between them. So we prove an inequality of this form, and this automatically allows to, to prove the existence, sorry, of an MLSI constant for, for the generator of this form here. As I said, this was sub uh, subsequently applied to some other uh, projects to obtain some other results of MLSI, but I'm going to talk about this in, in later in the conference, so I'm not going to mention it here. And finally, just to say that similarly to the result that I just mentioned uh, about how to prove uh, MLSI for uh, pinching onto different bases, we can do something similar for, uh, you know, in the context of uncertainty relations. So the, uh, this famous result from uh, some years ago really, uh, regarding two POBMs, uh, sorry, this yields uh, the, the following inequality in the case in which we have uh, two variants X and Y, and we have the presence of some side information M. So this inequality was proven by, by Frank and Lee some years ago. And what we do here is obtain something similar, but now uh, without uh, this side information. 
and uh, we focusing instead of these POVNs in pinching maps. And you see that actually the additive term is pretty similar because uh, the well the sign is different if you compare what we are calling here C1 and what they were calling C prime. And here we get some multiplicative term that they didn't have here. So this is why this is a bit tightened. So just to conclude, let me say that what we did here was to review some results of approximate tensorization of the relative entropy. And well, the main results presented in this project had to do something with, with the techniques of change of measure and some pinching arguments. And well, what we did was to, to briefly interpret the, the error terms in, in both cases. And finally, I just mentioned that there are some, some applications of such results uh, of approximate tensorization in different contexts, like to prove uh, uh, some functional inequalities or for, some, for uncertainty relations. And there are many open problems that deal from, from this talk. Uh, one of them is, for example, if we can improve the additive and multiplicative terms, because this will be desirable. And this is actually what we do in this subsequent paper and why we managed to prove some MLSI in, in a much more general context. And of course, something that would be really interesting is to know if one can do something similar for different entropy quantities that have a different application for some other functional inequalities or for some other purposes. So if you want to know more about this, uh, this is the reference of, of archive. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Angela, for your nice presentation. I don't see any um, questions in the online chat. Uh, Do you any questions on yes. the side? Let me check. Is there any question on site? Yes, there is one question there. Thank you very much for the presentation. I wonder, your uh, inequality depends on two parameters, C and D. So, uh, so I wonder if do you found uh, you proved the inequality for some specific uh, couple of values for C and D. You think it is possible that actually there is a family of inequality, a sort of trade-off between the two constants, or it is true only for some uh, isolated point in the C D space? You mean if uh, sorry? You mean if it's possible to remove one of the constants to have to express one of uh, the constant as a function of the other? Yeah, exactly. So the, the problem is that there is a trade-off between the two constants. So what we see is that uh, if we try to remove the additive constant, the multiplicative constant gets worse, and the other way around. If we get some uh, multiplicative constant that we can actually control because it has some physical meaning or whatever, then we have to pay the price of getting an additive constant. So I guess depending on the purpose for which you want this kind of inequalities, you need to pay one price or the other. But it's true that there are some new techniques that allow to, to obtain just one constant in terms of the other or whatever. But still, it's not completely decidable. It's not just like the only the multiplicative constant and with a very nice expression that you can control or something like that. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Other questions on site? Up there? There, there, there. Yeah, thank you. So it's um, the case of two commuting conditional expectation in the classical strong stability activity. It's clear. Uh, I mean, the motivation is clear. And what, what, where do these almost commuting uh, conditional expectation uh, are important, or where do, do you use them? Okay, so you mean uh, how we can interpret being almost commuting in the case of the conditional expectations? No, I, I mean, what the, what's the motivation for for uh, studying this uh, almost commuting uh, ah, okay, expectations? Sorry. Ah, okay, sorry. Yeah, well, the motivation is that when you consider the setting of a lattice uh, and you consider the conditional expectations given by projecting uh, with the Davis semigroup, for example, into sub different sublattices, uh, it's only normal that if you consider these conditional expectations with fixed point, the thermal state of the of the evolution, the correlations between separated regions should decay very fast. So in principle, considering this almost commuting relation, uh, it's like saying that the correlations between, uh, sorry, between the separated regions in the thermal state decays very fast. And this is something that is, is, that is expectable to happen. In, in quantum many, in many systems in general. So it's a condition that it's reasonable in, in this case. So from the maybe from the theoretical point of view, from the information theoretical point of view, it's more difficult, but for the context of many systems, it's justified in this case. 
I don't know if this answers your question. Yeah, yeah. So, so if if this um, if this um, I mean lattices are uh, close to each other, then this almost uh, commuting condition holds. I mean, if you have two regions uh, of spins which are which are close to each other, then then uh, yeah. So, so what's this C one typically? It's, I, I would say it's the other way around. This is why you need to consider the overlap between the two systems that where you're conditioning. Because when you consider the complements, this is what which should be separated enough. And when it's separated enough, in principle, these conditional expectations onto one and the other, they almost commute. So. Mm. Okay, thanks. Okay, so I would postpone any further questions to the coffee break and we resume at four. Okay, okay so thank you very much.